fighting is not a dollar move, tell us about um, multi-condensation multi relativity and superfluidity in solid solution for gases. So this is the, the, no? the title of the conference. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about this in the PowerPoint. Okay, the so you do not have a multi-condensation relativity and relativity by using the methodology and... That would be the perfect dog. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> My name is Mauro Doria. Doria, Mauro Doria, I'm from Brazil. Uh, we lost the game of uh, Uruguay in 1950, but uh, I hope that you don't consider watching my talk as uh, bad luck. In fact, I came with uh, blue because I'm supporting Azura, so everything will be the, uh, defined on the second half and we will have time to watch it. Okay, um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the organizers for inviting me, David Nelson, Andrea Ferrari, Lorad Milosevic, uh, Akari Shanenko, Fiorella Payano. I'd like to thank my collaborators. And um, um, the summary of this talk is uh, I'll be talking about um, first of all, the, uh, a non parameter approach to superconductivity. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, first of all the equations for low and high TC superconductors. I understand that high TC superconductors, those layer compounds where superconductivity originates in the layers. Okay. Um, I'll show you that uh, there are uh, inhomogeneous solutions or the parameter uh, solutions for, uh, in the absence of an applied field for the high TC superconductors in this approach. Okay. And they essentially consist of uh, schemions, which are topologically stable. Okay. Associated to this solution, um, we, there is a, a charge density wave that comes out of, uh, from this order parameter approach. Okay. Um, so I'll try to connect to the ideas with Landau theory, this uh, so-called first order equation. Um, and uh, uh, they predict, uh, from there, I can predict the uh, pseudo-gap density and uh, some uh, uh, natural frequency uh, oscillation between layers in the high density superconductors. Let, me, uh, let us uh, go back and recall a few facts about the low TC superconductors. In 1932, uh, was observed a peak on the specific heat in Holland by Kilson in Koch. Uh, in 1933, uh, Landau proposed a free energy expansion in terms of the current because he wanted to explain the Meissner effect. And then uh, in 1939, he introduced the order parameter approach. I mean, the current, uh, as we know, um, uh, will increase the kinetic energy. But what I'm going to claim here is that the high TC superconductors they have intrinsic uh, circulating currents. <coughs> So in 1950, uh, Ginsburg uh, and Landau proposed this theory, which is good at least to set the notation in terms of an order parameter of a covariant derivative, the condensate energy, and the local magnetic field, okay, as we all know it. In case of no uh, thermal fluctuations, for instance, if T is equal to C, this is the only negative term, and I remain with uh, three positive terms, and uh, the only possible solution is uh, uh, R the parameter equal to zero and no local magnetic field. Okay, this is, uh, oops, clear. Okay. Um, in 1957, uh, Avrikosov predicted the vortices in type two superconductors um, that were observed uh, 10 years later. And um, these are the second order variational equations that one obtained from the Ginsburg Landau free energy. Okay. What uh, very few people know is that uh, because of didn't use the second order uh, differential equations to, to predict vortices, but instead he used first order equations okay, uh, to discover the quantized vortices in type of superconductors. Okay. Uh, in fact, these equations were rediscovered in 76 by Bogomoni, who showed that uh, for one particular value of kappa, they solve exactly the second order equations. Okay. These are the first order equations. Uh, derivative of psi equal to zero, and this derivative is just d1 plus minus i d2. And the local field is uh, the applied field minus 
a constant and the order parameter squared. Okay. So these equations, they assume uh, that I have bulk superconductivity, but uh, with the translational symmetry along the applied field. Okay. So in some, in some way, they are two-dimensional equations, but they describe three-dimensional superconductivity. I, I call them often as topological equations because my point here is that they belong to a family of equations uh, that uh, besides the other uh, cause of Bogomoni, you have the cyber with an equation that they, they predict uh, uh, monopoles in four dimensional space. And I will introduce here another set of equations that I claim um, are as important to understand um, high TC superconductors as those were important to understand low TC superconductors. Okay? And these equations are the following ones. I, I must have a two, I mean, I have a two component order parameter. Okay? Uh, the equation that describes the order parameter is sigma d psi equal to zero, where sigma the Pauli matrices. And the local magnetic field is given by the applied field minus the sort of local expectation value of the um, um, sigma matrices. Okay? Uh, interestingly, these equations, they are truly three-dimensional. I mean, there is no assumption of uh, uh, symmetry along any axis here. Um, nevertheless, they describe a layer, okay? Uh, when you try to solve this equation, you see that uh, you have to assume a layer or some other geometrical configuration to have a meaningful solution. <coughs> First thing to observe is that these equations, they are really provide a solution of um, Maxwell's equation. I mean, they really solve a problem in uh, uh, magnetostatics, in the sense that if I apply the curl of H, I have Ampere's law, but if I take the divergence of H is also equal to zero, okay? It's, it's, uh, this results from uh, some manipulation, it's simple. I'll not do it here, uh, because the divergence of this uh, local expectation value is equal to zero. Okay. The other thing is that these equations, they uh, break time reversal symmetry, okay? Um, in here are the equations. I took the case of uh, no applied field, okay? Um, and if uh, psi and h are solutions, so are these, uh, uh, the complex conjugates uh, and the local magnetic field of the reverse sign. And I, we know that when we reverse the sign, we have, um, uh, uh, another, uh, we are breaking the uh, symmetry, the time reversal symmetry. So for the moment, I would uh, ask you to um, assume that we have a solution for these equations in case of no applied field, which is uh, not homogeneous, which is inhomogeneous, okay? It depends on x, okay? So I have uh, a normal parameter and a local uh, uh, magnetic field, okay? I mean, uh, um, um, as proposed by Abrikosov and used by mathematicians in the case of one component, these equations are always uh, thought to be solved in this way. One of them, you solve the order parameter, and then you fit in here, and you take the local magnetic field, and you go back, and you have an iterative pr procedure. But uh, here, we will assume that we have no applied field, but um, uh, there is a stable solution with a local magnetic field so weak, okay, that I can only, that's enough if I just go through one step. In other words, I solve this equation here with the gradient and I plug in here and obtain the local magnetic field, okay? I'm thinking of an expansion in terms of uh, epsilon parameter, the order parameter is very small and the uh, local magnetic field is uh, epsilon square. <coughs> so, I mean, we could go through this, but uh, just uh, Glance at it, uh, this is a solution for a single layer. Essentially, I mean, this uh, solution for this problem, you can see it, I mean, this is just, uh, if you take a, a Fourier space, K1, K2, K3, you get that this is equal to zero, okay? So one of them has to be complex. This is what I mean by uh, a layered uh, solution, which has to have this form here, okay? And if you work in details, uh, the other component, you get that. And interestingly, you get here k plus, but not k minus, which means that uh, really time reversal symmetry is being violated. And you get this x3 over modulus of x3, which means that um, uh, this solution does not apply for the layer itself. So this is some kind of uh, solution that breaks the space in two different 
the files. Okay. <coughs> Then you can go on and work uh, in a multi-layer solution, and, um, uh, and it's very interesting to notice that uh, uh, um, some expectations vary along the perpendicular to the layers of non zero. Anyway, uh, the, the, point, the important point is that if you believe in the, in the solution, uh, you find out that you uh, will have um, some surface currents. I mean, apart from the current in the volume, I mean, if you have a set of layers, if you have a magnetic field in one direction like this and below in the opposite direction, you have a surface current, okay? Um, and of course, in case that you have no applied field, the only uh, possible solution that you can have uh, uh, in this way is some, some kind of a magnetic uh, loop uh, along the layer, okay? And this is what gives some sort of topological stability because you cannot break these uh, uh, closed streamlines, and you have trapped solutions here, which are the schemions. <coughs> so, what are the schemions, uh, graphically speaking? Okay, they are uh, solutions that you have uh, some cores with the magnetic field penetrating on top and exiting below. Okay, and some kind of core circulation currents around them. So, these are, are the uh, Iskelions, vortices would be counted by the phase of the order parameter, but the Iskelions are counted by this quantity, where h hat is the direction of the magnetic field integrated on the plane, and the magnetic field being given by this expression here. Okay. Uh, an important consequence of these um, uh, these equations is that uh, so I have volumetric current, I have surface current. Okay, as obtained from the equations, but I do have uh, the divergence of the current is equal to zero. After all, this is just magnetostatics. Okay, uh, but uh, the thing is that the divergence of the surface current is not zero. I mean, it's equal to this this continuity given by the volumetric current. So it means that in this solution, I have current entering the layers, okay, circulating through the layers and, and exiting the layers. Okay, so I have some points that I could interpret as being a, a, a charge rate, okay? though this is a static uh, problem, uh, uh, non-zero charge rates in some points of the, of the layer that are associated to this. This is what I talk about having um, charge points of uh, positive charge and negative charges in the layer that uh, <coughs> uh, work like a charge density wave. Okay? Okay, uh, I want to justify these equations from the ginzburg landau theory uh, for the high TC superconductors. And I, I will work with this point here that the, uh, I mean, I'll try to associate with the uh, crossing uh, line between the pseudo gap and the high TC and the critical temperature, okay? Um, so my claim is that uh, the first order equations, they solve a ginzburg landau equation in this point, okay? And um, what you get here is a lattice of schemions that break the time reversal symmetry, display a normal state gap, which I will calculate here for you, above the homogeneous state. They have topological stability. They present an associated charge density wave. Uh, and they break translational symmetry because I will construct a tetragonal lattice of uh, schemions. Okay? So in, in other words, what I'm saying is that at, at this temperature, I have two states one is the homogeneous state, which uh, is the one with lowest free energy, of course. No other parameter, no uh, local field. Uh, free energy is equal to zero. And I have an inhomogeneous state with a free energy above zero, which is topologically protected from decay into the homogeneous ground state. It has no zero other parameter and no zero local magnetic field. Okay? And it, it, it develops an intricate uh, complex uh, set of uh, currents along the, uh, between the layers and within the layers that are interconnected, okay? So, I mean, uh, I'll think about uh, what I mean by free energy. I'll say that I'll associate that point, uh, kinetic energy, a field energy, and the condensate energy with a two-component order parameter, the kinetic energy being as simple as this, and the field energy being uh, this. Of course, if, the, if I, I'll, I'll say that the order parameter is so small at that point, okay, uh, one would naturally expect zero. Okay, the other solution would be very small. 
uh, such that uh, uh, it's, uh, I'll take this epsilon parameter, this is of order epsilon square, this is epsilon to the uh, fourth power, so this energy is negligible at that uh, point here. Okay, All, everything that I'm saying here so far is based on a mathematical identity that you can write the kinetic energy for a two-component order parameter in this fashion here, sigma d psi squared plus the local field times the expectation value of sigma plus some term here, which is a surface term that looks like a rush but term. Okay, this is a mathematical identity. Okay, it's very easy to prove this. Um, just uh, put the Pauli matrices here, but I will not have time to go through that. Okay, but the fact is that if you can, if I claim here that I have a dual view of the kinetic energy, okay, I have a dual view of uh, the current, the supercurrent. That's the kinetic energy, the usual one. And if you want to know the current, you just expand linearly in the vector potential. What you get is the well-known expression for the current. Okay. However, if you use this uh, uh, weird formulation of the kinetic energy, but uh, equivalent to the other one, and if you look at the current, you get this expression here. Okay. Uh, and that is at, at the heart of uh, a Rikosov's paper for one component that I'm extending here for two components. Which means that if I take that sigma d psi is equal to zero, the current this term disappears, and the current becomes just a curl of this term. Okay, and then you can see that you immediately can solve for Ampere's law and find this solution here. Okay, so the first one, the equation to get you for free solution of uh, Ampere's law immediately. <coughs> okay. Uh, now, if, you, if I go back to my free energy that I want to calculate, okay, and I want to introduce these uh, equations here, so this is zero, because I'm assuming that I uh, you know what it is. You see, this is of fourth order, uh, because uh, this is epsilon square, this is epsilon square, I can also neglect that, and I am left with this surface current uh, the term here, the rush about light. If I plug in the, my, uh, my first order equation, what I get is essentially that the kinetic energy is the expectation value of the Laplace of the density. Okay? If you go to Fourier space and look at uh, small, uh, the infrared region, small momentum, you find out that this is a gap. Okay? <coughs> this term is constant. Okay? If I take that uh, Fourier transformation for uh, psi. Okay? Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the condensate energy, this is of fourth order, and essentially this uh, second order term, I'll say that it will vanish at this, uh, at the crossing of T equal to T C equal to T star, apart from a little term here that I could discuss, but it also vanishes in this approach. I'll leave it for uh, behind for, the, for someone who wants to ask. And the, then what I mean is that the kinetic energy, uh, the field energy of order, fourth order, the condensate of fourth order, the kinetic uh, energy has this term here, which is of second order. And that's what I mean as being the, a, a, a non-zero gap associated to the inhomogeneous solution. Okay? So uh, uh, one of the Gisburg and now equations, what is Ampere's law, was already solved. The other one, you see that the, it is solved because this is of our cubic order, the term in beta. This is vanishes in t equal to c. So if I take this Laplace, this uh, gradient square operator and play with Pauli matrices, I find out that what I get is sigma d square, uh, which should vanish. And this, what is, remains uh, uh, here is h times psi. And this is of cubic order. order. What we, so it means that the equation at the end has this uh, uh, loop here, which means that the first order equation is so both Landau, uh, Gisburg Landau equations up to order epsilon to the cube at, for this particular uh, temperature the, the, uh, I'm considering here. Okay, okay so let's go for uh, new features of the high TC uh, superconductors. The motivation of this work is a pseudo gap. As you know, the pseudo gap breaks uh, time reversal symmetry spontaneously, as shown in the work of Kaminsky and proved by many others since 2002, in the sense that uh, circularly polarized light that goes in one direction rotates differently from the opposite direction. Okay. 
Uh, it very breaks spontaneous uh, translation of symmetry, okay? as shown since 2004 by many. First, they was observed in the core of uh, vortices. Okay? The fact that you have, uh, uh, they initially was called a uh, checkerboard phase, because this is a STM picture of 4A, A is in itself. They could see a periodicity in 4A, okay? uh, showing uh, now this, this is interpreted as a, as a charge density wave. Okay, with this periodicity. Okay. Well, so the gap defines a transition line. But uh, I mean, one important point is that uh, uh, that many people worried about is that in the um, um, if you have a, si a system that breaks time reversal symmetry, okay, and if you look at the work of Gorkov and Volovic about order parameters, you find out that uh, uh, breaking the time reversal symmetry implies in a magnetic order. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it is the uh, reason uh, that um, people like uh, Varma, for instance, look at uh, orbital currents in the pseudo-gap phase, because there should be some magnetic order here if you have the breaking of time reversal symmetry, uh, orbital currents. Uh, but many have done uh, uh, NMR, NQR, USR experiments to detect magnetic order in the pseudo-gap, and nothing was found. So they only could put bounds in the uh, maximum local magnetic field of order 7 to 0 0.7 Gauss. This is a work by Hugo Keller and collaborators. <coughs> One of them. OK, predictions for this point. So what I'm going to say is that I'm going to associate that uh, I have a, a, a very small uh, magnetic field. Okay, so the, I, what I'm portraying is that the high TC, you do have uh, magnetic order, and you do have a local magnetic field, but it's so weak that it's the below uh, threshold of detection. For instance, I'll consider that it's 0 0.01 Gauss, okay, and I'll take, uh, I'll consider, say, a checkerboard cell for the my periodic spin and lattice of size L4A, 1.6 nanometers, okay, and then I'll go uh, uh, to this uh, free energy gap that comes out of uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, of, my, of the present arguments, and I find out that, the, that there is uh, that this gap, the value is uh, one MeV. Uh, this is a gap density per uh, nanometer uh, cubic. Okay, just to give you an idea, for instance, for metals, this density, okay, that's two times the gap times the density of uh, is uh, of copper uh, zero point one MeV. For the high DC. To just take uh, multiply by 10, I mean, it's in, uh, 10 times uh, higher energy, you get 10, 10 MeV per nanometer uh, cubic. So, this number, I mean, that comes out from this one is okay. I mean, you know, so it means that uh, it's not crazy to assume that uh, one has a very low uh, magnetic field. And, uh, I mean, above all, in, uh, is uh, the prediction that you have natural oscillations in this magnetostatic. Uh, model, which means that I'm really able to say what's the sigma dt, the density of uh, group of that uh, uh, go through the planes, uh, the layers at each point, okay? And it's set by this scale, if you do the calculations, by this local magnetic field C times L, where L is the uh, spherical lattice, okay? And uh, if I plug these numbers in, I get uh, 10 to the minus 7 ampere nanometer squared, okay? And if I try to go beyond my, the model, this is not in the model, but I say that this sigma dt is really some coupe pair that uh, pass through uh, uh, that uh, unit cell, it means that I will assume that Q <coughs> is, uh, is just a coupe pair charge, I have some frequency, and I have this area of one nanometer square, and then I find that there is this frequency of 10 uh, to 12 hertz, which is more or less what people find uh, the claim that you have uh, of a Josephson coupling between layers. Okay. So this would, uh, instead of, uh, would provide a picture that perhaps you have uh, uh, natural oscillations because of uh, this um, motion of charges. Okay. Uh, conclusion stimulus uh, lead to oscillation between layers in the gigahertz, terahertz uh, ratio. Just to give you an idea, for instance, this is uh, 
the charge distribution on a layer, okay? So we have uh, positive and negative spots. According to selection of CK, I mean, you see, I, I have not fully determined the other parameter. It's just an expansion in Fourier uh, series, and I have plenty of uh, room here, okay? Um, and this is a picture of the local, uh, the magnetic field perpendicular to the layer in a layer. You see positive and negative points, which means that you have a magnetic field penetrating okay, the layer and coming out, and you do have these loops. Okay, so for conclusions, um, so what I'm saying here is that uh, 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 these topological equations, they solve the uh, two components um, uh, ginsburg landau theory, uh, at least in this uh, temperature here. Uh, and uh, you do find an inhomogeneous solution without the presence of a, uh, an applied field, okay? Um, and this is, uh, uh, we associate, I associate to the, uh, it's a, a sort of normal state gap would be uh, the value of the pseudo gap at that particular point. Um, there is a current density wave associated with it, and you do have a, a natural uh, oscillatory behavior between layers out of this very simple model. Thank you very much for your attention. No, it, it comes out naturally. Is it seen in the experiments? Uh, uh, no, I mean, what you, what, you, what you mean by seen in the experiments? I don't experiments? know. I, I mean, it will be seen in the experiments. I mean, in the, in the little <laughs> cold gases, they, they make it spin over coupling by hand, by like no. using laser beams. Yeah, but, uh, well, here, what I'm saying is that if you take a two-component order parameter, naturally, it contains this spin orbit, orbital interaction. Okay, what you introduced at the very beginning is just a flavor, uh, two-component flavor right. symmetry. Right. It boils down to be a look uh, SU2 spin symmetry. So you have to put in this, the Pauli matrices. No, I don't. What I'm saying is that it's not, you, one naively can put there two flavors, right. two components. But what you are doing naively, you are really putting in uh, SU2 Spatial symmetry there. <coughs> and that is why the Pauli matrices, they arise naturally. All right, I have to talk to you about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I might have missed this point where, when you talk about the charge density wave. I, I figured out that in some sense you show that this current uh, with a non-zero divergence on the plane is related to the change of some uh, area of density on the plane. But how do you figure out this in the, in a stationary state? Would this lead to some charge accumulation somewhere in the sample? What I'm saying is that these uh, uh, equations, they give you a normal parameter in the local magnetic field. Okay. Okay. But these things, they all originate on really on two-dimensional layers. But they outlive outside. It is as these equations assume a metallic behavior okay, outside. So you, in a whole space, you have local magnetic field currents, but you have these uh, cores, I mean these layers, okay, these singular things that where you have current that enter at some point and exit at other points. Mm -hmm. So you have points that are of accumulation of this, uh, so this of the surface currents. Right. Okay, this is what I mean by having charge there that I can calculate. So there is a charge accumulation there somewhere. Is. Yes, okay. there is. And uh, it's a state with uh, higher energy, but it's protected by topological stability. Okay, you cannot uh, disappear. That's the point. Thank you. You said that we don't, cannot decay the uh, topological stable state. Exactly. You cannot decay the uh, topologically stable state. Uh, uh, I'm going to the simple question. Uh, you mentioned that the lattices, you can mention that the dragon was? No, it has. No, this is assumption. It can be any shape. Second question, what happened, what do you expect happened in the environment of the field? In? In the field of the field. You are going to have vortices and mingle with uh, stimulus solutions. I mean, it's a, it's a more complicated structure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
this assumes that the two components are characterized by the same mass. No, any chemical to get the uh, mass and isotropy, no problem. I mean, but uh, you you always can you have to be able to reduce by scaling to that simple kinetic energy. So you keep the same symmetry by scaling. Yeah, you change by square root of m or whatever, you know. In that equation, you may always rescale. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The the eight that you show in the I have a big H and small H. Big H is the applied field. Small H is something that uh, arises naturally if you have an uh, inhomogeneous solution for the problem. Okay, this is for the one component case you don't have the solution; it's trivial, zero. But for the two components, you do have some non-trivial solutions. That's what C is. Well, just related to your last question, uh, why is it not one and it has to be one minus you get Q minus two uh, for the one scalian uh, solution? No, you can have, uh, I mean, uh, um, the, these solutions, they have, they, the way I showed you, uh, they, uh, just to say to properly answer your question, uh, Yeah, that's the solution for one layer, for instance, okay? Uh, you see, you have the CK coefficients, which are totally arbitrary, and this is a solution of the problem. So, uh, the first one, the equations, they don't determine fully the, the, the problem. They give, you, uh, they give you room, okay? So, for instance, I uh, have looked at many with uh, well-defined angular momentum properties states of uh, D wave, S wave, uh, uh, and all these, and how the gap is, and so forth. You can uh, work this out, you see. I mean, I mean well, this would be fixed in principle by a free energy, which has not been discussed here. I mean, unless by the fact that at T star equal to Tc, you have a tremendous uh, degeneracy. Okay, out of that, there may be other interesting things that are taking place. But the charge of the, the, the charge of the scheme also modulates the charge density wave. That's right. Yeah, the charge so of the scheme. So you can uh, yes. decide which one is more yes. excitable yeah. to yeah. So far, what I have been able is to once define the angular momentum property to determine what's the scheme of charge, and they change according to the angular momentum. Okay, the scheme of charge. But uh, so. Um, so, so the, the, the psi breaks spatial reflection and time reversal. So it's a chiral, chiral density way. Um, so it is uh, because there are propositions for the pseudo gap in the cooperates with chiral density. It's a chiral density. The chiral density. This is what it is a chiral density way, and, uh, and then there are different. In fact, it, I do understand the science, science but the, that you can understand some of the. But you see, I can have many. Chiral things here. It's, it's a tremendous de degeneracy. So you can have many solutions with this uh, uh, breaking of chiral. For example, if you have a big wave, Charles Einstein wave, then simply by the orbital effect you generate the dxy component and then it becomes chiral. And then you have this kind of uh, diamagnetism that is uh, not associated to spectrolactin state and mm. by but, but I can't talk to you. Okay. Well, uh, all this just follows from extending the Abricos uh, Bogomoni equations, which are for one component, to two components. All the rest just uh, sit and comes out naturally. Mm -hmm.